Good morning and afternoon, everyone. This is Laura Stewart, Director of Online Channel Events for SASMAX, and we are excited to have you here today for our snapshot webinar with our vendor partner, CoreDial, Private Labeled Unified Communication Services. We're really excited to have them here with us today to educate you on what they offer to you as channel members. I'm personally very excited to be hosting this webinar because as a former MSP after having sold my company after 15 years, I had a multi-state um, MSP. If I had known a company like Cordial when I had my MSP, I would have done a heck of a lot more unified communications work than I did. It just was not as easy to do unified communications as Cordial has made it. So I'm really excited for you guys to be able to hear what they're going to be talking about today and see the, the really cool opportunities that you have as an MSP to enter into this great space. So today, what we're going to be talking about is I'll give you a little bit of background about SASMAX, then I'll introduce you to Cordell, and they'll talk about the unified communications market, why you should consider partnering with Cordell, how the paradigm has truly shifted from what it used to be and what it is today around unified communications. Their business model, pricing, commissions, incentives, I know everybody wants to know this, what is the revenue opportunity for you as an MSP and how you can get started working with them. So what is SASMAX? We help resellers discover the right SAS apps and earn more revenues. One of the things I knew very much as an MSP was how frustrating it could be to find the best solutions that were channel friendly, all in one place. You'd go to 30 different websites, you'd call all of my other friends that were MSPs, and then you'd have to make 10 different phone calls. What SASMAX does is it enables you to have your own dedicated partner success manager, you get special offers and incentives from our channel friendly vendors, you get all in one place a way to search for the top SaaS applications in the world. Comprehensive data per app will help you by introducing you to those people and find the right solutions for you and we educate you. <coughs> and by the way, we also offer you white labeled SaaS web stores. It's free for you as a reseller. We'll talk more later about how you can get started with us if you're not already working with us. So Cordial, I'd like to introduce Jim DeBall, the VP of Channel Sales for Cordial, and he has a special offer for SAS Mags resellers as well. So Jim, take it away. Thank you very much, Laura. I appreciate you having me today. Join your members. We've been a member of SAS Max for a number of years, and we like the work that you all do, so we're happy to participate. Um, as is alluded to on this slide, and Laura just referred to it, all SAS Max members are participating um, or participating in this webinar are going to be offered free onboarding and training until April 31st. So if you reference this webinar in the future up until April 31st and you happen to become a partner of ours, we're going to waive all the upfront onboarding and training fees. If you go to the next slide real quick, Laura. So I apologize to everybody because um, I'm probably going to say go to the next slide a couple of times before uh, before the webinar is over, and uh, that's the way we're going to coordinate it today. So a little bit about Cordial. We've developed a cloud-based unified communication service, which is completely private labeled for MSPs, IT integrators, VARs, IT solutions providers, and the like. In other words, hopefully all the people that are on the call today. Um, by the way, we, we interchange the term SAS and UCAS in some of the slides, and I just wanted to point that out because for purposes of our discussion, they're really interchangeable, they have the same meaning. Um, we've been around for 12 years, so no instant gratification for Cordial. We've been at this for quite a bit of time. And as a result of our efforts, we're proud to say we now have 600 partners and growing, as is alluded to on this slide. There was also a press release that went out, if any of you saw it maybe in the last couple of days, which talked about us signing our 600th, 600th partner. All of our partners are North American based, and as the next slide alludes to, we have a considerable number of customers and end users um, on our platform. And all of the people who do business with us are doing business with us as a result of the partners that we've signed up. <clears throat> and just 
Uh, I apologize, uh, Laura. I didn't mean. Yeah, if you go back two slides, <laughs> I'm sorry. And then finally, we have not what we consider to be a Fortune 500 company, but we are a nice 150 employee company. Everybody again is uh, based here in the U.S. and uh, because again, we've been sticking to our knitting, we've we've been able to forge a nice partner community here here in North America. I'm sorry, Larry. Go to the next slide. I apologize. So this slide is intended to be a little eye candy. Um, we're happy to and proud to talk about the awards we've won over the years and to point out the beautiful people we've hired. Um, so uh, I guess the most notable uh, award that we recently received was what the EMY Builder Building a Better so Ernest and Young Award. Yeah. So. Um, I'm sure lots of organizations have awards and they're no different than we are, but we're really happy about the accolades we've received over the, uh, particularly the last three or four years as our growth has accelerated considerably. Let's go to the next slide. So more to the point, what, what the heck does Cordell do? We try to summarize in this slide exactly what we do. Cordell enables companies like yours, the folks on this call, to quickly and cost effectively sell, deliver, manage an invoice for what we consider to be high value unified communication services all under your own brand. So in the, within the four walls of this organization, we talk a lot about cell deliver managing invoice and we even refer to it as an acronym, SDMI. And it encompasses all the workflow management tools that we provide, that Cordell provides to our partners through our platform, through our software platform, our SaaS platform, our UCAS platform. It's really what makes us different than an agent model. We don't think agent models are bad things. We think agent models are different things. All of the partners that we do business with are considered private label partners, and all the end users that do business with us do business through our partners, not directly with Cordell. We, we never interfere with our partners' relationships that they have with their end users. We remain, for all intents and purposes, odds behind the curtain, to steal a metaphor from the Wizard of Oz. So we run all the in, indoor plumbing, and our partners are ex, 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 externally facing to their customers. And uh, we feel like we're one of the few organizations in the industry that, that actually provide a completely white labeled solution that doesn't infringe upon our partners in any way, shape, or form. To go to the next slide. So this may seem sort of rudimentary, but I'd like to define unified communications. I always hate uh, when folks talk about acronyms or use acronyms that they don't define, so I figured we'll take a step back and do that here. Unified communications is simply the seamless integration of communication tools like voicemail, instant messaging, chat, uh, SMS, fax, email, presence, and the like, that all relies on a VoIP foundation. Everything is becoming completely integrated and, and will continue to do so in our opinion. And I don't see any indication that we're going to become less unified in our communications over the years to come. A simple example of a unified communications application is you receive a voicemail on your phone. That voicemail is sent to you via email that you may receive on your smartphone or your computer. You can listen to that voicemail delete that voicemail, forward that voicemail to another employee within the company, and so forth. So it's no longer just you know, the dummy down version of, 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 of the PBX, a host of PBX. It's more than that. It's becoming more than that. It will continue to evolve to more than just a phone system. It will become a unified communication solution, as I just mentioned a second ago. OK, next slide. We like to make sure that everybody is at least on the same page relative to the growth potential within the market. The net of this is that the market's growing quickly and it continues to grow exponentially. By most experts' um, estimates, I was at IT Expo last week in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale and I was able to participate on a number of panels and listen to quite a few discussions and the, the market penetration is, seems to be pegged at about 15 to 18 percent, which means that there's a heck of a lot of up up uh, room, headroom, if you will, for growth within the marketplace. If you go to the next slide, the, the increase in adoption of, of unified communications is really being impacted, in our opinion, by a number of factors that I wanted to point out. So if you go to the next slide, the first is the, a paradigm shift that really I think everybody's experiencing, and that is we're moving to a subscription-based economy. I'm sure we can all think of examples in our own personal life and in our businesses where we are subscribing to services that we never thought potentially possible, let alone that we would ever take the time to do it. And not too distant past, we would all subscribe typically to a magazine or a newspaper, and that was the extent of subscription services. But now I subscribe, for example, to the Dollar Shave Club, which sends me razor blades every month. 
And if you had imagined that, or if I had imagined that I would be having razor blades sent to my home every month and not having to go purchase them at the grocery store for what I considered now to be exorbitant prices, I would have said you're crazy. But Dollar Shave Club got recent was recently purchased by Unilever for a billion dollars after five years in business. And there's lots of examples of this. Again, I just point that out because I happen to be a, a user of Dollar Shave Club. But in your personal life and your professional life, I'm sure you can see, you do see witness examples of this every day. Gartner predicts that by 2020, more than 80% of the software providers will be shifted, will, ha will have shifted, excuse me, to a subscription-based business model. IDC predicts that by 2018, 65% of the world's largest enterprises will have committed to becoming information-based company <clears throat> companies, excuse me, shifting the organizational focus from product sales to ongoing services. So I guess the bottom line is subscription-based economy seems to be here to stay and doesn't uh, appear to be going anywhere fast. The upside for all the people that are participating on this call and for those that are participating in the subscription-based economy is that subscription-based services translate into monthly recurring revenue, which can be a wonderful, wonderful thing if you can take advantage of it. And we hope to help the people that we do business with, our partners, take advantage of that fact. The next slide talks about a second paradigm shift, which is disintermediation. <clears throat> so disintermediation is a big word. But at the end of the day, it refers to the fact that your customers can buy services and products without having to go through the traditional middle person or inter intermediary um, or fewer middlemen or middle women. So um, you look at examples like Amazon. Amazon's certainly an intermediary, but a different type of intermediary. And we feel like um, if you are a service provider, if you're an MSP, an IT integrator, or a VAR, and you're not considering the fact that the relationships that you have with your, your suppliers could potentially lead to disintermediation, um, you know, we think you're being short-sighted. We believe that, in fact, there's a possibility that all of us can become disintermediated at some point, and we want to help our partners prevent that from happening. Our business model is built around the concept that our partners are the ones that are important in a relationship with the end users. We don't fire our partners. They fire us. We don't contact them and say that we're eliminating our agent program, that they're no longer a part of it, or that we're reducing commissions. We don't have the relationships with the end users uh, that would allow us to do that. Um, you know, and one final simple example of disintermediation, not to be the dead horse, is if you looked at the early years of the internet boom, a company by the name of E-Trade came in existence because a lot of folks like myself and others wanted to do self-directing investment, and that wasn't even a possibility. But um, you know, there's lots and lots of examples that I, I'm sure that all of us can, can point to. If you go to the next slide, so what, what can you do? You, you can either sit on the sidelines and, and, and wait it out and or go out of business, which we don't think either of those options is very advisable. But we do think that the small business owners who service the SMBs are at an advantage. And we believe that because at the end of the day, the small business owners service their customers better than most of the larger entities that are also trying to go after the end users. Um, in other words, if you're providing a, a good service, a great service experience for your customers, you're at a big advantage. You have a big advantage over other organizations that are out there. Secondly, um, if you're able to move up the value chain, the food chain, right, with your customers, you can create a scenario where you become the technology experts for your customers. We think there's great value in that. And our experience with our partners is that they're doing exactly that. They are promoting the concept that they are the ones that have the knowledge that the, part, the customer needs, the end user needs, across multiple technologies, and that those end users can rely on our partners for the expertise in those areas, including the subject we're talking about, which is unified communications. All right, so we're going to go to the next slide real quick. So given the two paradigm shifts I just mentioned, the subscription-based economy that we are finding ourselves in the, immersed in, and the possibility of being disintermediated, what is the impact to your business, the people on the phone's business? Well, technology vendors who traditionally provided individual products and potentially some services and all played nice together, <clears throat> if you go to the next slide, are now vying to become the technology vendor or IT solutions provider to those same customers. The folks that we find ourselves competing with used to be our partners, in other words, in the past, and everybody seems to want to 
vie for the same technology spend or dollars or wallet that the end user has um, available. So if you're a one-trick pony, in other words, you're probably missing a great deal of opportunity to diversify your revenue base, your customer base, and um, put yourself in a situation where you're not being disintermediated in, into the future. Let's go to the next slide. By being a Cordell partner, you're able to provide your customers a unified communication solution. In other words, capture more of your customer spend, be a single IT solutions provider, and our solution maintains your brand and your customers. So we provide a complete platform for the business owner who wants complete control of their, their UC product offering, and, and even more than that. Our platform is actually pliable enough that it allows our partners <clears throat> excuse me, to, to bill an invoice for more than just UC applications. But for our purposes, if you just wanted to add a unified communication solution, we don't believe there's a better solution for the, the, those out there who, again, might find that being an agent isn't necessarily to their liking because they're, they're foregoing their, their brand to another entity um, and or, more importantly, the revenue and the margin they can generate by being a private label partner. Um, last point on this slide is, our partners, when we train our partners, we actually share with them best practices. It's similar to, not exactly the same as a franchise model, except that obviously our name is not on the marquee. But in the franchise model, you find that you are educated by the franchisor um, as, as you should be around the business model and all the things, that, all the landmines that you should be looking for. And we do exactly that. But Again, our partners have ultimate control of their business and the way that they want to implement the business model is, is within the realm of their, their uh, creativity and, again, their control. Next slide. Put, you know, kind of where the rubber meets the road. So I know um, SAS Max has been very uh, helpful in helping us put together these presentations. And one of the thing, things that they asked us to do was to talk more about our programs. So that's what this slide is alluding to. <clears throat> so that all the folks on this call can leave having a fairly good understanding of the types of models, business models that we enable for, for our partners. So these are the three plans that we provide to our partners. And depending on the partner's business, for example, how many customers you have um, and how often you're running into unified communications opportunities, you would probably be slated into one of these plans. And, and we don't slate you, you slate yourself. Through the, uh, the sales process, we educate our partners on the differences between these three plans. And then at the end of that discussion, our partners are able to make a decision as to when, where they feel like they need to enter the relationship and where that relationship um, you know, should, should kick off. So you can be a fast start partner, a premier partner, or an elite partner. Thinking of these plans in terms of small, medium, and large, um, you know, the more volume, if you will, you do, the more customers you have, the more customers that you are able to sell the service to, the, the, the more likely you are to you move from one plan to the next, and again, that has a big impact on the potential margins that you can, you can witness in, in our program. We don't prevent people from moving from one plan to the other, by the way. You're able to do that, um, and you control that with, within you know, the realm of your own experience with your end users, how many end users you have, and so forth. And we're going to talk a little bit more about margins in the next couple slides, but if you go to the next slide, um, here's, some, here's an example of four types of partners, small, medium, and large. So you have a customer, a partner, excuse me, who has $1,000 a month of recurring revenue that they're billing to the end user. That's annualized in the second column. So simple math here, 1,000 times 12 months is $12,000. You can see the estimated gross profit margin for that size partner, that size Cordell partner at 50%. That gross profit margin is is provided in dollars monthly and then dollars annualized. So for even a smaller partner, I would consider a partner who's only billing $1,000 to their end users as, you know, fairly, fairly small. We, we, we like partners of all sizes, of course, but if you're billing out $1,000, you know, it's not, it's not uh, chum change, but it's not huge. You're still witnessing a, what we consider to be a, a, a considerable amount of profit from, from that small amount of revenue. If you go to a $2,000 partner, someone who's billing out to the end users, again, $2,000. You can see, again, gross profit margin um, in dollars and, and uh, uh, monthly and annualized. And then $5,000 a month biller, again, to the end user, and a $10,000 a month biller to the end user. So at scale, 
we have partners that are actually seeing more or greater than 65% gross profit margins. And we provide what we consider to be an entry point in, 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 in our plans that allows our partner to grow and grow their end user base, grow their revenue, and grow their gross profit margins over time. And again, at the end of the day, our partners are in complete control. So if we are for some reason not providing the service that our partners are expecting, because they have the relationship with the end users, they have the ability to move those end users to another platform um, or do whatever they want with them. Certainly, we don't believe that that would be the case or that should be the case if we're doing a good job. And we would obviously do everything we could in our power to maintain our partner's relationship. But the point is, at the end of the day, our partners are the ones that are in control of where their customers are getting services. And uh, hopefully those services are coming from you directly as a private label partner. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Before I get to some end user examples, we just wanted to point out um, three simple attributes that we recommend to our partners that they look for during the onboarding and training process that we take them through when the, uh, they're looking for end user subscribers. So if you have a customer or customer base that is comfortable with cloud-based services or monthly subscription fees, that's typically a good attribute that would lead them to want to uh, or be more amiable at least to the idea of cloud-based voice service or unified communication service. Second attribute would be a customer who desires a single trusted advisor. The negative connotation is one throat to choke. But as I alluded to earlier in, our, in, the, in the slide deck, we find that a lot of our partners are vying to become a single solutions provider for their end users for the, all the reasons we just mentioned. And in keeping with that uh, goal, if you have customers that are more inclined to want to do business with fewer vendors, then you typically have a really good opportunity to sell uh, a variety of services, again, including unified communication. And then the last and most obvious probably is the customer who has a phone system that just simply lacks functionality. And, and you may have customers that don't even know what functionality possibilities are. They don't even know they're lacking functionality, maybe until you go in and educate them on what could, could potentially be provided to them. So if you can run into these three generic attributes within a, a single customer or your customer base, we feel like you're pretty well poised to be able to provide a VoIP, a, you know, unified communication solution to those customers. So if you go to the next slide, here's a couple of examples, real life examples, end user examples that our partners have shared with us um, that we will share with you. So the first example is a real estate firm and the partner that sold this real estate firm shared all these details, but um, you had 10 offices, approximately 250 employees across 10 offices. They had friend-based phone systems, Nortel systems installed when our partner encountered this end user. They also had, it's not pointed out on this slide, but the end user had 10 Fios connections and 10 PRIs. If you're a telecom person, you know what a PRI is, but at the end of the day, it's a telecommunications connection directly to a friend-based PBX. Our partner was able to save this end user a ton of money. Um, the, the fourth bullet point shows what the retail price was for the service, but this was a savings, a significant savings over what they were paying for um, just their PRIs for their 10 offices <clears throat> but that they were able to get rid of. And you can see on the final bullet point, the profit margin for a partner. Now this is a pretty big end user, right? It's a medium to larger end user. But we'll show you in a minute in the next slide, um, a smaller end user. Um, I just want to point out that you know this is not atypical. Um, this would sort have been atypical end user I think 10 years ago, but what we're finding is that our partners are moving up the, the, the customer size. Um, the, they're not just selling 10, 15, 25 endpoints to really small to micro organizations. They're certainly doing that, but they're also doing even more. They're selling to larger organizations as, as well. The second um, example, which is this slide, and, you, and, and the last one, by the way, the sales cycle was 30 to 60 days, and you'll note that one of the biggest differences on this slide isn't just the size of the customer, but the sell cycle was only two days. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. And the reason it was so short was because this was a doctor's practice that was being impacted, was impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Um, this end user, this doctor's office, was completely out of water or underwater, no pun intended, because of the hurricane. And this doctor, this doctor's practice is in the business of delivering babies. And when people pregnant women can't get a hold of their doctor, they tend to be a little upset. So our partner was able to uh, secure this, this opportunity, this deal, and put a temporary solution in place while numbers were being ported, um, 
and everybody was up and operational within a, a short period of time. And this opportunity, it's an 800 a month bill, billable customer. So again, not micro, but not huge, pretty standard. 800 to $1,000 a month is a pretty standard end user. And the profit margin on this deal was, again, pretty significant, 65%. So go to the next slide. So I'm going to wind down here and, and share some, some sales speak with you on why we think we're a, a suitable partner for everybody. But Cordout is an organization that's been around for quite some time. I know 12 years isn't uh, 100 years, but it's a long time in our business. We have a scalable, profitable, reliable platform. <clears throat> Early in our existence, we made mistakes like everybody else did in terms of scalability, and we were able to survive and thrive through those, those missteps. Um, we have big company sustainability, but you know, small company responsiveness. We think that's important because, again, we're not 15,000 employees or 150, but we can't lose an entrepreneurial spirit, which got us to where we are today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we provide unbeatable packages. A program that I mentioned earlier allow for profit margins that are 65% or greater, again, at scale. We find that we have the most endpoints of any of the competitor, direct competitors who are offering white label solutions in the space. There are certainly lots of VoIP providers out there that have more endpoints than we do, but they're selling directly to end users and or selling through agents. We are the only organization, we believe, um, that sells, I'm sorry, we're the only, we're, we have more endpoints than any organization that only sells through partnerships or white label relationships. Um, today. We have, as I mentioned earlier, 600 partners out there. Again, we have the, what we believe to be the largest channel community of white label providers in this space. We have a ton of resources, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, available to our partners because we recognize that all of our partners, our success, success it depends on us and our success depends on them. So we don't have a bet on two horses, which is a direct sales organization and a channel organization. We have a bet on one horse, and that's all the partners that we do business with. Um, on that last slide, I just want to point out one other thing. I apologize, which is we have a multi-switch solution. So not to get too technical, which isn't the uh, intent of this presentation, but we just announced, and we have a big uh, kickoff call with our partners today about rolling out the Broadsoft call control system. <clears throat> our pro our partners don't interact directly with Broadsoft software. The beauty of our solution is we sit on top of the call control system, Broadsoft in my example, um, but we're able to integrate underneath the covers multiple call control systems and we're the only organization that provides multi-switch platform in that regard. And the reason that that can become so significant to our partners is we feel now because we have two platforms that there's really no end user opportunity our partners could ever encounter that they can't service. You could argue that some of the features that Broadsoft brings to the table we may not have had in the existing platform call control system that we have in place, but now that we have Broadsoft as well, we believe we address 100% of the market. So I'm sorry, go ahead to the next slide, uh, Laura. Thank you. So alluding to the resources we bring to bear for our partners, you see here quite a few examples of that. We have marketing distribution funds that we share with our partners that they can then spend on a variety of things, including marketing campaigns, <clears throat> training, and the like, or just reductions off their bills. Um, we have a lead generation, end user lead generation program that we're very obviously careful about in that none of the end users ever do direct business with us. We pass those end user leads to our partners. We have a partner advisory council, which we think is important as it relates to making sure that we're getting constant, receiving constant feedback from our partners. We also have along the same line, a Partner Connects conference. Uh, we have our second annual this year here in Philadelphia in April, and that's an opportunity for all of our partners to congregate in one place and hear about all the things we've done, all the things we're doing, and for us to receive feedback from those partners as well about things we might need to be doing better. We have monthly webinars that we share with our partners relative to best practices. So if we have a new piece of equipment or a new piece of software that we need to educate our partners on. We have an all partners conference and a webinar, excuse me, and we gather around the campfire and talk about that. And then I think this is actually probably one of the most significant things. The way we structure our sales organization is we have dedicated resources after the partner has uh, signed up with us and been trained. Uh, they're called partner success associates or advocates. 
PSAs, and their sole responsibility in life isn't signing partners. It's making sure the partners we have are receiving the type of attention that they deserve. Um, so I, I think that's, that's been a really smart structural change that we made over the last five years, and it's, it's been, uh, uh, I think, very beneficial for, for our partners because they have a single resource that they can go to um, for a variety of things. You wouldn't go to your PSA if, for example, you had, I don't know, a porting issue, but you could, and you typically would if you weren't feeling like you were getting the type of feedback or response that you wanted from the group within our organization that handles porting. Um, we also uh, will round out the, the last couple of bullet points. We've really, I think, re re revised, if you will, or hardened our onboarding and training process over the years. I think that those partners who suffered through the early onboarding and training process with us, if they went through training today, they would see a far different um, experience or have a far different experience and see a lot of additional resources, all of which, by the way, came about because of the feedback that our early partners provided to us after they were trained. Um, we also have a, a private label mobile app, which has been rolled out for the iPhone. Android is uh, on the horizon, in the near horizon. We also, you know, one of the things that a lot of our partners ask about is tax issues related to becoming a VoIP provider. So our software provides integration with a tax automation system that calculates all the taxes to a penny for all of our partners and all their end users. And then finally, although most of our partners and users connect to us via public broadband connections, we do have the ability and we do have partners to take advantage of the ability to connect to us via private MPLS connection. If you have a customer that needs it, um, you'll know because they'll speak loudly about it and we have the ability to service those customers. <clears throat> to go to the next slide, here are two examples of partners who we've added um, in the last couple of years, three or four years, who were not offering unified communication solutions until they did business with us. Cloud3 was a, a break-fix tech organization, a VAR. They provide a lot of equipment and break-fix, and they quickly found that they were able to um, you know, change their, their customer profile and generate additional revenue by offering a, a hosted, uh, private-labeled, excuse me, white-labeled um, unified communication solution. They were finding they were competing with a lot of organizations who were doing, in other words, a lot of things that they did, but were also providing a VoIP solution, a unified communication solution, so they were um, getting cut out of some deals that they didn't want to be cut out. And so by adding that service, they were able to further solidify their, their relationships with their end users. And the second example is, again, a company, AF Daniel, who does business with us. And they were uh, primarily an agent. They were you know, an agent for telecom providers for many, many years, and they dabbled in IT work, but they've completely transformed their business over the years, and now they offer a completely integrated solution for their end users that's all cloud-based. Well, not all cloud-based, but majority cloud-based. Okay, if you go to the next slide. So that's really it for us um, in terms of Cordell's story and how we believe we can help all of those folks on this call. Um, we're happy to answer questions. We hope that you have some questions to ask. And um, this is my contact information, by the way, so if you ever need to reach me for any reason, um, we want to make sure you have this available to you. All right, well, thank you, Jim. That was a very robust presentation with lots of great uh, data around the revenues that can be generated as a, a reseller selling your product line. I have a question that pops up for me, if you don't mind answering it. Um, sure. So how is Cordell different from, say, like a RingCentral, Mitel, some of the big cloud communication providers? What differentiates you from them? That's a pretty common question, and I appreciate you asking, um, or whoever posed the question asking. The biggest difference is really in the business model. I think, from what I understand, I've never used RingCentral or 8x8, but I, I understand they have a pretty good service. I haven't heard many people recently, in the early days when they were figuring, figuring themselves out, like all of us, they were having some issues. But I think they, they've gotten past that. But again, the biggest difference is really the, the business model. Those organizations do a fine job of servicing agents. But we believe that by becoming an agent, you're really being short-sighted or you're foregoing a lot of the opportunity that you should be taking advantage of, not just revenue, but again, the relationship that you can build with your end users through a private label uh, service. 
owning the end user, leveraging your own brand, building brand for yourself. These are assets that are that are also, um, you know, at some point down the road can become a liquidity event. So if you decided as an MSP to sell your business, which obviously you did, Laura, and you're generating a considerable amount of reoccurring revenue that you own, that's not commission checks from a carrier that can potentially change over time, but end users that you own, you have contracts with directly, there's a, a greater uh, valuation on an organization on business like that than there is if, if you don't have that, that type of relationship with your end users. So I guess the short answer is they have fine, fine services from what I can gather, Ring Central and 8x8 and the others, but they just have a different business model. You mentioned the recurring revenue and it, it did make a difference when I sold my company because it exponentially increased the amount of money I got for selling my company and the people that were interested in it. I was recently interviewed for an article on Forbes.com about selling my company and that was a big piece of it about how I converted from the non-recurring to the recurring and how it at least six times increased the amount of money I got for the sale of my company. That's wild. I, I was at IT Expo last week at Fort Lauderdale and I happened to be sitting with a, a two guys. They, they um, own a, a VAR and they are Toshiba dealers and they seem to be doing a really good job. Um, they were selling Toshiba's, they are selling Toshiba's hosted solution. They, they seem very happy about it by the way. Toshiba seems to do a really good job for them. No complaints. But when we started talking about the one guy was the owner and he was getting ready to retire and the other guy was the young sales executive that worked for him who seemed like a sharp guy that he was ultimately going to buy the business. So it was kind of interesting. I was stirring the pot a little bit by pointing out to the owner, you shouldn't be selling your business to him um, at the price you, you wouldn't be selling your business to him at the price you are in, if you were private labeling with us. Uh -huh. um, so we were teasing each other, of course, but at the end of the day, the reality is that, to your point, the business owners have a greater opportunity for a liquidity event if they are in a situation not just you know just not not just because it's multi recurring revenue, but it's profitable multi recurring revenue, and it's and it's customer base that that they own. So, okay. Evan, another question. You say up to sixty five percent margins. What are the average margins that you're seeing? Um, so, what happen what happens is early on in the relationship with Cordell, you're really probably seeing more like 35, 30, 40 percent margins from from Jump Street, right? From 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 get go. But as you get to scale, you get to a couple of hundred endpoints, which could be one or two or five customers. Um, then you start getting into the 50% margins and then into the 60, 65%. So it really depends on how long you're a partner of ours and how aggressive you are about selling the service, honestly. Um, I used to say that 70% of our partners, because it was true at the time, 70% of our partners are generating 65% gross profit margins or better. Now that's true after a partner's been with us for 12 months. And again, it's only because there's a learning curve, they have to get going, they're not losing money up front, unless of course they don't have any customers, which is not a good thing. Um, but once you get to you know 12 month mark, get to a little bit of scale, I'm not even talking about thousands of endpoints, which is probably not even conceivable for some managed service providers. But once you get to a couple hundred endpoints, you're starting to see 50, 60%, 65% margins. Okay. Another question, is it a difficult process to transfer from an agent to a white label provider? We, we don't find that it is for a couple of reasons. You'd expect me to say that, of course, but the reality, course. Is, that, <laughs> the reality is that in talking with folks like the two gentlemen I mentioned at IT Expo, they're doing level one support already for all their customers via the Toshiba solution. Um, and I don't think the, the business model of Toshiba has any different than any of the other organizations out there. I hear the same thing from Ring Central agents. Um, they're doing more of the level one support anyways. So the biggest, I think, hurdle if you have one in becoming a, an, moving from an agent to a private label model is understanding that you're responsible for the end user's level one support. Now we're not talking about you know the type of level one support that would put anybody, I don't know, that would kill you. It's not rocket science. It's typically level one support you're providing already as an agent, but they are going to con the end users are going to contact you. I think that's the biggest obstacle. The, 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 the nice thing is if you're moving from an agent model to, to, to a private label model is you do have customers that you already have relationships with that you can move over as their end user uh, agreements expire. 
and you already know them, you already know what they have, it's, it's an easier transition for you and for the end user. Um, they typically can use the same devices, the same handsets, the same phones, uh, unless you did something completely off the reservation, but typically it's, you know, the, the common players of SIP providers out there, SIP phone providers out there. Right. This next question, I'm going to combine several different questions that all seem to be along a common theme, which is I'm putting it under the onboarding training uh, process. Okay, so what types of agreements do our customers need to sign? Do you provide us with templates and contracts that we would give to our clients and have them sign? And what is the agreement time period that our customers would be involved with? Yeah, great, great question. Great multi-question. So as a partner of ours, the platform that I was alluding to throughout the presentation that we provide includes all of the workflow management tools that are required for our partners to become a private label partner. So for example, I mentioned sell, deliver, manage, and invoice. When we talk about sell, the part of our portal, the part of our software that allows our partners to sell <clears throat> is, includes a quoting system, a quoting tool, a, a, a proposal tool that's all private label to our partner. So our partners don't have to create proposals from scratch. Um, we provide them the entire template that they leverage and go out and hand to the end user when they're signing up an end user. It includes language. It includes, you know, if you look at an order form for a VoIP service, there's some things in there that if our partner had to create from scratch by themselves, it might cause a little bit of pain and uncomfort. We provide all of that. That's all in there. The end user is signing directly with the partner. They're not signing up with Cordell. So the end users aren't under a term agreement with us. They're under a term agreement with their partner. Now that term agreement is within the control of the partner. If a partner wants to sign up an end user, you know, the earlier examples I had, a real estate firm or a doctor's office, to a month-to-month -month agreement, our partners are free to do that. They don't have to ask us for permission. They don't need our blessing in that regard. They can do whatever they want. If they want to sign the end user up to a 60-month term which would be the other extreme. They can do that as well. They are completely in control of the pricing that that end user is going to receive and pay. Um, ultimately, they're in charge of and they decide what the term is. Our partners are under term with us under a two to three year agreement. But again, it's an aggregate agreement. We're not micromanaging our partners and users. So we don't, our partners and users are not under term with us for two to three years. Their end users can be under term with a partner for month to month agreement. We just have an aggregate relationship with our partner for a two to three year term. Does that answer all the questions? Did I get that? That does. Um, okay. That answered all the questions related to onboarding and training, which feeds to, I think, the perfect last question. Somebody want to know, is there a way that they can get a demo of the software yeah. and the process with you guys? Absolutely. Um, if you contacted me via the contact information that you see on the screen here still, I'd be happy uh, to arrange that. It's a pretty common part of our sales process. We don't recommend anybody ever sign up with anybody, including us, having not seen the software or demo of the software. We even let partners at the right phase of the sales process test the service. I mean, you know, something as simple as just hooking up a, a couple of phones and making calls. I mean, that's, that's a pretty rudimentary, basic uh, type of test, but I mean, if I were going to get into a business relationship with a company like Corda, I'd want to do that just to make sure that the service works. So we we're amiable to that idea, of course. Uh, we do have one other question that just came in: What phones are needed for the service? So we the physical. Yeah, question. yeah, great question. So there's a lots of options that the partners have in that regard. Um, if you look at like a smartphone application, we provide a smartphone application. There are also off-the-shelf smartphone applications out there that you can use. <clears throat> if you're looking at desk phones, you can really use any SIP device that you want. Now, <clears throat> that sounds too, a little salesy, so let me qualify that. There are probably 75 to 80 different models of phones across multiple manufacturers that we have templates for, uh, configuration files for. So we've pre-configured are predefined the configuration files for 75 to 80 phones. I forget how many exactly. That's why I'm giving you a range. But the typical cast of characters, Grandstream, Polycom, um, um, Astra slash Mitel, 
Yealink, Cisco, I mean, I could go on and on, right? Panasonic, all of them provide really nice hardware. And our partners, by the way, are able to secure those handsets from the distribution partner of their choice. So they don't buy the handsets from us. And the reason they don't is because we had really no value. All we would do is buy the equipment and mark it up. And what our partners can do is buy it from distribution or distributor of their choice. And they can rent the equipment, they can lease the equipment, they can sell the equipment on their own. So, um, so, so the partners really have the ability to choose from a variety of handsets. The reason I said that they can use any SIP devices, our software allows for our partners to create their own config files for any SIP phone they want to use. So I was at IT Expo, as I mentioned earlier, last week, and there were a number of manufacturers down there that I hadn't seen before. I had familiar, familiarity with them because I've seen them on the internet, but I hadn't seen them display at the show. And they approached us and said, hey, you know, what do we have to do to get our phones on your platform? I said, well, if you can create the config files for the partners, then you can, you know, that's all that's required. Create the config file, and all of a sudden, it's another option in the pull-down list. So we're pretty open-ended in, in that regard. We don't force our partners to use a specific manufacturer or specific model of SIP phone. They really have a, a variety of options, and that's the way we like it. Perfect. If anybody has any last questions, please remember to put them into the question panel. If not, all right, I see no additional questions coming up. Um, I think there was one other thing, Laura, you were going to mention, or I was going to mention, or one of us was going to mention, which is the estimator, the revenue estimator. I think as a result of this webinar, you're going to send out a thank you email to everybody uh, for their attendance. And in that email is going to be a, a link to what we refer to here at Cordell is the revenue estimator. And that revenue estimator is a tool, web-based tool, that allows our partners to plug in a variety of uh, of information, like how many endpoints you could potentially sell in a year, a month, whatever. And then when you put that information into the revenue estimator, it'll show you how much revenue profit um, that you would generate. So we think that's a nice way for people to, you know, if they're just kind of interested and they're not really sure, 100% if they're interested, they can look at that and that might give them a little more information beyond what I've already shared with them. I, I love revenue estimators. I think they're a lot of fun to play with. <laughs> so it's a, a great thing. And yes, we are definitely sending that out along with the link to the recording for everybody. Cool. Cool. Thank you for uh, making it available. Uh, you're welcome. Happy to do so. All right. So we have a couple of upcoming snapshots and events coming up next. On Wednesday the 22nd, we have a HIPAA webinar. Um, and then on March 1st, Iron Scales, who just won a major cyber defense award, will be presenting our snapshot and our cybersecurity roadshow. If you're interested in going to any of those, just please shoot me an email, and I will be happy to um, help you out with them. Or you can go to our wisesas.com and look at events and register for anything that is coming up. Remember, don't leave money on the table. Become a SASMAX reseller. Reach out to Cordial. They're a great vendor that I wish had been there when I was uh, an MSP. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Jim, thanks for uh, doing the webinar with us. We are grateful for all that you do for all of our SASMAX resellers. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.